Today we're really honoured to have a good friend, a very dear friend, uh, Jungajai Brady, also known as Troy Brady. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're recording this on with the Turrbal and the Yagara people and pay our respects to all elders from past, present and all those elders that now make this country a great place to be. Mm. And uh, we really do pay our deepest respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And our special guest today, Jungajai. G'day. G'day. Hello, Wanderer. Same sentiments, my respects, and acknowledgement always to the Aboriginal custodians, the traditional owners of these beautiful lands where we are sharing ceremony, where we wake up and go to work, where we see those tall buildings there, these are the, you know, the country and the rivers belong to the Turrbal, Yagara peoples. I'm a Gugu Yalan Jiburi man. Final Queensland, historical ties to Sherberg, War of the Palm Island, and further up north to Yarraba and um, Hopevale, but um, and also the Brisbane Black community. Um, been raised down here since I was a small little Jajum, and um, yeah. Big family of ten. Yeah, the Brady Bunch. Brady Bunch. Brady Bunch. And you've got how many children yourself? So I've got two boys. Two, um, yeah, one's um, 22 this year. Yep. The other father's 18 this year. I've been um, blessed with two beautiful grandsons. Wow. One's three, the other father's two. Didn't anticipate um, so early in life, but um, those guys have been um, my, my little saviours with um, a few things that I've been going through these last couple of years and stuff. But um, yeah, man, I look for them, I dream yep. for them, and um, yeah, they keep me aligned. And so you were raised up in Anala, weren't you? Your family was based there? So basically, yeah, I was born up in Rockhampton. Um, Dad come down, he was playing, uh, he got invited by um, Wawa, he's, he's passed now, Uncle Sid Cool. Mm -hmm. It was um, synonymous around the black community for football. Yep. So he ran, he ran the kangaroos in the early 70s. Wow. So off the back of that, my father was um, gunning it a bit. He made the first Aboriginal um, Australian side in 72. They toured over, over New Zealand. And, um, and that's, that's the same, um, what do you call it, platform that they used, the Indigenous All-Stars, after many, many moons later. Wow. But long story short, Dad come down in the early 70s. Um, and um, yeah, off the back of that, we, we, we kind of, you know, all my siblings got, had come along. Mm -hmm. we, we anchored in Goodna first, from Goodna. My father um, purchased his own place. And another one of the first black, um, you know, um, families out there to do it. Wow. I think ATSIC um, back in the day were, yeah. you know, sponsoring, but just, you know, enabling um, black families to, to partake and participate yep. in, um, you know, wealth creation, yes. the opportunity to buy property and stuff, because, that, that, you know, before Dad's generation, my grandfather, and the, and the forefathers of mothers before they had no hope. That's right. You know, to, to purchase their traditional lands and um, participate in, you know, agriculture, all that type of stuff. So mm. when Dad got that opportunity, he pounced at it. And um, that, that was our home. That was our home. I had a beautiful upbringing. Yep. Yeah, man. How many brothers and sisters? So I have four brothers. Yep. Um, and I have uh, six sisters. Wow. Six sisters, yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a... Yeah, it's a definitely. It's wow. a motley crew. Yeah. You know? You know, you know, character plus. <laughs> and so you I fed right in the middle. I was right in the middle. And so you moved from sport and uh, into music. How did that transition so, happen? So, yeah, all the way up, like I've kind of, be, be, between myself and, you know, my siblings and stuff, we always did well in sports. Yep. My mother and father always encouraged us, rather than you fellas getting out on the streets, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and running a mark per se. They had us in sports. Yep. They, they tied, you know, we tied, we, they tied, you know, they, they run a tight ship, basically. Mm. And we were blessed, you know, my mother and father, they, um, they didn't drink or smoke. Yep. So we weren't brought up in a household that, you know, was um, always, you know, at parties and stuff like that, you know. Yes. And, um, yeah, so it was a beautiful upbringing. Mm -hmm. And I went from, I got home one afternoon, I was representing for the Met West Rugby League. I was the captain of, of that side going into the Queensland finals. Not the Queensland, what carnivals. Down in um, down the Gold Coast, and I go on a, got home one afternoon, and my father said, "Go into the room and grab your stuff." I said, "Dad, 
what are you doing home this early? You're usually home in about another hour and a half. He said, we've got to go up to Matt West for your training. I'll be here for his jets. I said, oh, oh, OK. I... So anyway, I went into the room and stuff, and lo and behold, there's a electric guitar, a black electric guitar, wow. an amplifier, and a mic and a mic stand. Mm. And I'm looking at this, I'm thinking to myself, not for John, my big brother, but he don't sing. He sing a bit of reggae in the room and stuff, but... And I walked back out, mum and dad just sitting there, you know, just... And mum was like, no, oh, he bought that for you. He saved up for six, eight months for that for you. I was like, dad. No discussion prior? No, no, no. Well, he heard me singing in the room, oh. but... I said, mum, I don't even sing in front of you, fellas. What do you want? What, what are you trying... You know, I mean, I'll practice, you know. But they had an old acoustic guitar that my uncle Les, yep. late uncle Les. Um, yeah, and, f and from that moment he bought me a Beatles book, anthology book. Mm. And I started learning all the old Beatles songs and stuff. And yeah, wow. man. So yeah. how old were you then? I was about, um, probably about, I think 14. Wow. 14, so that was before the AFM War and stuff. And off the back of that, I think it was a couple of months later, there was um, a fundraiser. Ed and Nala at um, Wandara Preschool on Azalea Street, across the road from where I used to play football. And Uncle Bimbo Smallwood, that, it was mopping the dropouts. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Who were very, very successful They were, at that they were time. renowned amongst the black community and respected. A couple of big hits, but... Um, Just on that name? Yeah. Was, was that his real name? Who's that? Moppy? Mopping the dropouts? That's his... We, we, like we, all, his got, we all got nicknames in the community. Once oh, you get that course. nickname as a kid, yep. that sticks. So I don't actually know Uncle Mops. So I just know his Uncle Mop. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, long story short, they're all up on stage and they're like, Dad has set my little gear up before I got up there. I'm like, oh, this is far up. <laughs> Come on, man. And I jump up on stage and stuff. The old crowd was going, yeah, get him up there, you know. <laughs> so I go up there and I click in and stuff, but I didn't look at the crowd. I was too shamed. I looked at, I think it was Kerry Jackson, I looked at Uncle Bimbo, um, Bimbo Duncan. Uncle Bimbo Duncan was my coach on under 12s a few years before we won the grand final. So I was comfortable with him then. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of, kind of kept on looking at him, he's like, gee, and I played a G, dick it, ding, old country, dick it, D, ding, 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 I knew the basics. But then when I, I think they started clicking into Brisbane Blacks on TV, you know, that, that's on them. And I, yep. that, that old leg was like that. And I started, oh, all right, they all, you know, all the mobbers sit on TV, eh? singing all, all of the songs and stuff, and <laughs> that was it, man. That was my first little taste. So Aim For More, you mentioned about Aim For More. So how did that come about? So, you know, just I think, um, so a few years later, we'd unfortunately lost a sister, my sister. She was at the Laura Dance um, Festival, and she unfortunately had a car accident. That was... Um, that was like a pendulum shift. Mm -hmm. Just my whole world was just shooken. She was the one that inspired me in so many facets. She would dress up for us kids and she'd sing on a Saturday night for us, come out mm -hmm. all dressed up in a fancy frock and she'd be singing Patsy Cline and, you know. I'm like, look at this one here. Mm -hmm. And she can do that with no shame. I mean, I've got no chance, you know. But she was my inspiration yep. all those years ago and I still hold on to that mm -hmm. to this day mm -hmm. in terms of passing it on to my kids. But... Yeah, so we lost there, and I was at another footy carnival. I was um, um, playing for the Brisbane side down at the Gold Coast again. Um, I think it was under 16s. And I got home one afternoon, and I said, Dad, where were you? How come you weren't at the carnival? He comes to all my carnival games. Mm -hmm. He said, no, jump in the car. Me and my mate go cruising back to Anala from a case ridge, Archerfield. He said, I've got to tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, we lost your sister. I'm like, I just couldn't comprehend or just, you know, what did he just say? Which sister you talk about? Who are you talking about, Dad? Jackie Mack, Blackjack. And I was like, what? So kind of, you know, we, we got home and stuff, and I seen all the cars just kilometres down the road on the other side. I'm like, wow, this is real. And then kind of throughout that process, we all in, went into our own shell within the Brady household and stuff. And, and same with me, but I'd met the brothers around similar, the, the similar time, mm. and I started hanging out with them. We are doing practice stuff, like in the community. This is Rodney and... Rodney, um, it was um, initially, um, who was there? RJ, come a bit after, but it was John Bull and John John. So we used to play, go up and play basketball mm -hmm. up in Nala High School, and that's why I was hanging out with the boys and stuff, just to get away from that, 
you know. Mm. I'm comfortable feeling at home and stuff. So yeah, and then one afternoon they come back. I said, come back home and work out downstairs and stuff. So we're working out and, and in the still of the night comes, comes on the radio, voice to men. And then naturally enough, we all go into our natural harmonies. And John John, who has a, mm. a voice of an angel, starts singing the lead in the still. And um, yeah, we were like, hey, <laughs> did you fellas hear that? Because <laughs> we didn't add harmonies or anything like that. But we just locked in Rodney at the high, falsetto. Yep. John John had that nice baritone, and I just kind of just went down to the um, third below. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Mum said, hey, Richard, well, she was watching downstairs and they were roaring to there. She said, come on, keep on practicing, I'll get you followers in a week and a bit at the Nalo High School. Nato. I was like, what? That's all my school. And I was still in grade 12, the other boys weren't. Um, I 11, sorry. But yeah, long story short, yeah, we performed up there. I had an anxiety attack, all the above. Yep. But that was the best, best, um, yeah, that was the best move for me. I sang in front of all my students, all my fellow students, all my teachers. So how thousand, did, thousand, how, thousand of them. So I met you around 1995, I think, the first time. Yeah. <clears throat> and you were, um, we've debated how young or old, I thought you were about 17, 18. Yeah, so... Um, and you had Rodney and you had Harry? Yeah, so Rodney, Harry, myself, and it was uh, RJ. George. RJ? Is that George? Was it George? Yeah, it would be RJ. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rossi Johnson. Yep. So I was asked for when we, we would have mm. met you. Yep. So I would have, uh, yeah, so I was 17 and 93. Yep. So around 94, 95 is when you come along. Mm -hmm. and we, yeah. And um, yeah, we just so, started finessing. So I came just as a mentor uh, every week to talk about music business. Unbelievable. Wasn't it? Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, you run us through just the, the nuts and the bolts, mm. how to set up a sound system. Yep. You know, just, you know, just the, the one percenters yes. that make the difference as important as it is to be out there. It's good to know the little things that make up that, you know. That and then, landscape. And so in Anala, it would have been interesting. You were starting to do music um, around, obviously, Boys to Men. But then around that time, did Style and Up start to develop? Yeah, so I think the that was time? early 2000s. <clears throat> yeah, oh, no, 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 late. I don't know. Late I'm, I'm 1900s. Kind of, yeah. Uh, 1900. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 20th yeah. century. But around that time and stuff, and um, it was a great initiative for the community. It was... Um, you know, kind of, you know, owned by, you know, Brisbane City Council, but the way that they, in, the engagement of the Inala elders, the Inala community and its stakeholders... Yes. ..to put on something that was of national focus. Yes. Because people from all around the country, plus headliners, like Shikaya, back in the day, there was a lot of big acts that come. Christian and Nimeo come there. But, um, yeah, man. A lot of people didn't know that Stolen Up was the largest um, Indigenous hip-hop youth festival. You know, and the Brisbane City Council really took a big chance on that and then to establish it in Nala for close to 13, 14 years, yeah, I think, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I, I got involved in different elements. Yeah, and all credits too, time, you know, it, it, Charles, what's Charles' last name? Kush. Charles, Charlie, Charlie Kush. Kush, doing wonderful yep. things now with Brisbane Festival. Um, yep. Athel. Athel Young was a... Athel, another, another guy that was instrumental in those yep. earlier, you know, infancy stages of, of that... that um, and I met your younger brother, Darren. Darren, Darren also, you know, um, mm. he was a proactive... That's you know, right. And, um, you know, getting a master back in the day and stuff. And it did, it, it set a precedent. Yeah. It set a catalyst yep. for what, could, you know, communities could potentially do around. But also just the, 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 the component of workshopping and yes. engagement of the young people to get them prepped to perform under a, you know, professional capacity. Yeah, that's Smoke right. Smoke machine, yep. lights. It's like you're going to the Groove and the Move Festival or something, mm, mm. but in an hour. I know. You know? It was amazing. It was, yeah, it was deadly, man. Well, got, 10,000 people. A lot of fun memories, mate. Yeah. But, um, so it would be you know, good to see something that is more, more um, conducive to the community as a whole, Brisbane. Yes, yes. Brisbane, you know, yep. where we can identify the different strengths within the communities. Young people mightn't have the, um, you know, the, the ability to jump up on stage and do particular things like this other young person could, mm. but they can, you know, you know uh, managing the stage or assistant managing or, you know, just... But there is a lot more opportunity now oh, yeah. than, than there was back in your day, wasn't there? Because yeah. you were sort of cracking the, those early days, really, for contemporary music. I mean, from what I recall, there was a lot of interest around country music, yeah. you know, which a lot of the older um, parts, members of the community loved, didn't yeah. they? Also that rock, Desert Rock. Oh, yeah, that's um, right. Who was it? Um, George yep. Rumbu, Grumpy Band. Um, 
even, you know, like non-Indigenous bands like Midnight Orb, they, they find the flag for, you know, black fellow social affairs and stuff. Yes. We were brought up with all that. Yes. You know, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was beautiful and stuff. And, um, but yeah, no, there was, um, not that it was frowned upon, but I think where we were standing in the, 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 the lane that we took, no one else was doing it apart from, you know, um, a Polynesian band mm. culture. Yep. And right. um, a human nature. Yep. Is it human nature? Yeah. Yeah. It was a vocal group. Yeah, the, the, that's yeah, right. The, yeah, the yeah. white fellow, a vocal group. Yes. So, you know, apart from those two and us fellows, yeah, man. We were, and the, the only looking back is probably the fact you didn't release any albums well, we, of we your released, own music. Well, we released one album and stuff. Yes. I didn't think the emphasis was there to take it further. Mm -hmm. But I think for us, because, you know, if we did all the beautiful songs to appease what the community wanted. So if we were doing a NADOC ball or something down in Tasmania, they wanted the only use, they wanted the sherry, they wanted the, you know, this, this, that, all, all the fun stuff. And that was beautiful and stuff, and it was a great apprenticeship to yes. harness, to learn, to not be shamed, yes. to get up and perform and to learn how to engage and, mm. and all that type of stuff. And I learned that. And I carried those same uh, mechanisms and traits with me now. But back in the day, if we were to throw in an original song with that, it couldn't compete. No. The original stuff could not compete with those songs. No. And that's where we fell short of yeah. an original's, you know, um, identity. Yes, yes, yes. Interestingly that um, around, around that time, I'm just thinking, and I had this great thought, and I'm just going to stop for a sec. We can edit this, so don't worry. Yep. I'll come back. Have yep. a cuppa. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> now, there's a really good question coming up. See, and all that stuff oh, that I was no, talking I about, yeah. I'm, I'm, it's in the theatre. It's yeah. in the theatre thing that I'm doing with Ursula Jovic. And this is what I want to talk about. So from that, it really, you then became a mentor yourself with your own people. And I can remember, even at Stolen Up, there was that program you worked with um, Daniel Sporowski, who's now head of audio at JMC College. No, the name rings a bell. My memory is very vague. No, 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 that's okay. You, you actually worked with a group of kids at uh, Glenala no, High School. Glenala High School, I remember that. Yeah, eight yeah. weeks, prepared them all up, got them to write their own tunes. They called it BNS, remember? BNS, yeah, I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> and you, that was the start of your mentoring, giving back. Yeah. And then you went and joined Creative Tracks. Creative Tracks. So yeah, tell so us it, a bit it, about Creative so it was, Tracks. It was a beautiful um, transition mm. from going to, you know, um, you know, just performing and stuff, but also the, the engagement and, and empowering our younger people that were, you know, had the potential to jump up on stage. So some of those um, things that you were focusing on and talking about, it's just like, wow, this is amazing where we can sit down and we can just, you know, just pass the tools per se yes. about what I was taught about those little one percent of that yourself. Our ex-manager, our old manager, Garth Torrey, bless his heart. Yes. And, um, and just to see them at the end of that process jump up and have a good GO yep. is, is the most, um, you can't put a price tag on something like that as in terms of spiritual nourishment, but also, you know, like, wow, I but, was a part of that. And, where, and what communities did you go out to with Creative Tracks? Okay, so Creative Tracks come a couple of years later. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't, you know, met up with um, Bridget Gary. Yep. And, um, you know, there was Kits, there was Mayala, there was a lot of, you know, solid, um, beautiful people that are still proactive in the community now. Mm. That was about 2005, and um, man, we went up to Hopevale, engaged the kids with um, Warabinda, where else did we go? All Sherberg. around Brisbane, Sherberg, yeah. yep. uh, King Arroy, mm. and um, they're the same again, just, you know, seeing kids that, you know, on the precipice of just hiding under a rock. They, they did not want to be seen to at the end of the process, talking, but also singing and delivering a beautiful song that was theirs. Mm. Yeah. And you see a lot of that coming now with like Maisha out of Wurrabinda and you know, he's doing incredibly well. There's so many yeah, coming that, through now. Yeah, what, what happened to that young girl from where she had come? I mean, you know, a year before, you know, she blew up. Mm. She, lost, uh, she lost her name. Yep. And I was only with them. I met her back here, you know, a couple of months before she passed and stuff. Yep. So, you know, that one's a bit close to my heart, but to also see her up there in mainstream picking up these, you know, these National Ari Awards and stuff like that, but also getting the recognition, yep. you know, but, you know the, but also the platform yes. is important. Totally. You know, yeah, she's a, she, she is a, you know, a, a proud um, First Nation Murray black artist and stuff, but to see her up there, you know, uh, mixing it with the best out there mm. you know, is, 
It's gratifying. And to see that young girl that we, that we met up in Warbinda at that little, um, oh, what do you call it, at the back of the school there. Man, it's just amazing. I'm like, wow. I'm looking at Kitchen um, and, and Bridget and say, hey, this one can sing. <laughs> she mm. can sing. Yep. You know, when you, you hear something good for the first time, it's just like, oh. Now, talking about singing, you had an opportunity too with, you had a touring band uh, for a number of years, I recall. And then didn't you go on one of those TV programs and have a shot at, <laughs> at that once or twice? So I, was, I was working at Nala Murray eh? um, in 2000, I think it was 2000, 2001. I can't remember. But um, Trevor and Mike's, the ex-wife, she, she, she called me up, her and her best mate, it was in the theatre piece, I think Showboat. Yep. Um, over in, in the valley, they said, you need to come in here right now. We are standing in the front, we are waited, you just need to just jump in the line and cut through. I'm like, Trev, I'm not coming in there and doing that. Shame, you know, I'm working here. But Sandra, only Sandra Bond, who was a manager out there, she said, hey, I explained to this, she said, she said, Joy, get in the cab or get in your car and go straight in there. Because at work, I was singing all the time anyway, you know. The reason why I started work was because I broke up with that. Ain't for more and I, we disbanded and stuff. So mm. I, I just said, you know what? I've got a kid. I've got a mortgage. I just want to work. Yes. That's all I want to do. Yes. I just want to do that nine to five. And it was beautiful and stuff. Um, but yes, <laughs> it was at one of the buildings across the road. There. What was so, that show? What was that? Pop Stars. Pop Stars. That's right. <laughs> now you either won it or you came close. Uh, I, I come within, uh, I think, the last six <laughs> Oh, it's comical when I think was that a now. good experience for you? Yeah, it was all right. When you, you know? look back? Yeah, when I look back, you know, it's just, you know, you just got to have thick skin. You got to, you know, have a certain identity without conforming mm. too much because you haven't got too much leverage in terms of your direction, you yes. know, your originality. You know, you're kind of moulding and stuff, but, you know, I was, I was, you know, I was advocating, man. I was wearing the Blackfellow shirts. Mm. Or, you see me in some of the shots, I've got the Blackfellow flag. And I just said, you know, I've, I've, well, to the producers, I said, you know what, I've been down here in this beautiful big mansion at Hunter's Hill with all these young ones here. And I said, and this is the way that I'm on back up there, working community capacity building mm. in the community. I said, how come we are getting paid X amount of dollars yep. when I could be making that there? What are you going to do for me? Mm. I said, I'm not going to tolerate this. Mm. <laughs> that next night, he's gone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he's voted out. <laughs> Get rid of him. But you then went on to the black um, band. What was that all about? And was that after that? Did that occur after that? You, yes, you, you yes. Sort so of that's 2001. So 2003, four, Trevor and I, you know, apart from the work and stuff, we, we got a little, um, um, what do you call it, a little um, a covers gig yep. at Chicago, is at um, Malcolm mm -hmm. So we did that for a good year and a bit. Mm -hmm. Just Friday, Saturday, we, they pay us our money, we pay our bills. Yep. And that's how it was. We had mm. a good setup. But from there, I started writing. Yep. I started writing and I started reconnecting with my old uncle who, who, know, who knew language. Yep. See, all the way throughout high school and growing up and stuff, I always wondered, you know, I knew my historical ties strongly. Yes. But I didn't know necessarily my traditional, mm -hmm. my traditional land, my language, everything pertaining to what um, traditional law is. I always questioned, I always, you know, what is the dream time? Where do I fit, in, where mm -hmm. do I fit into that landscape? Mm -hmm. And um, throughout that, that transition or that phase, you know, I jerk and then Dini would come along in 2003 and stuff, but that's when I really started looking. Mm. And so I had this old um, Yellinji dictionary that was passed down through the family, but I thought, oh man, it'd be good to go see Uncle, um, Uncle Kwanji living up in Gimby. I knew that he, he spoke it. Yep. And um, the, the, the other time that I met him was when I was a small boy myself. I think I was 12, 13. My father took us up to Gimby to meet this 106 year old Google Yellinji man, the last of our clothesless ones. So I met him around 1990, 91. So we went up there and stuff, and um, I'm sitting there, I'm looking at this old man, I said, Dad, is he really 100 plus years old? He said, yeah. And this man was, he was like Michael Jordan, mate, like the shack. I'm like, oh my wow. God. And so strong, wow. I could just remember his arms and hands were just as big as Popeye's. I was like, man, I'm mighty. But he had all them scars from when he was you know, slashed and stuff by the old, you know? Wow. Yeah, yeah, but um, no, he had a story to tell, but when he started speaking that old, that old Google, I was like, oh. <laughs> So you've learnt your language now? From yeah, your... so out of that process, so I'm sitting, I'm listening to this old man speak, I'm just like, wow. I said to Dad, man, this is like, this is like, this is like lightning. Mm. It strikes me right there because, you know, all those years that I wished about, when I, or that I wondered about, what is the dream time? The dream time is right there. Mm. There's a dream time. Yep. He waited, he waited 100 plus years to find, you know, some of his Western, you know, sons. Yes. 
you know? And um, yeah, moreover, you know, 30 years later, I went back up there to Gimby, to that same house, with my two kids. So my brother and I, my father, but this time I went with my two kids. Yeah, man, so, you know, it was just, it just seemed like it was, it was purposeful. And so you're teaching your children the same, or the same, young adults? Same. Language? They speak language same they language. understand? Yeah, they, yeah. they understand. Yeah. All Bajigala, like small way. Yep. But um, they, they, they've been out. They, they understand. Yep. When they grow older, they'll be looking for it more. Yes. You know? So this is a beautiful search. And this is your generation. Do you find more and more around your age are doing the same, like returning back to where are the roots, what is my language, my culture? Yeah, yeah. I think How because I the wrong? old people, and because we, we are more informed, yeah. we are more educated about what actually went down, yes. historically. Yes. So we, we, we're no longer going to you know, be enamoured yes. or panned down to our system. That was nefarious. Yes. That was the best choice, and the way that they had treated our old people and stuff was like, okay, that's happened. We we, we don't forget. That's right. You know, that for, for me, waking up every morning, you know, I'm just like, okay, how am I going to be productive today? How am I going to better my circumstances, but also my family first and foremost, but also the community as a whole. Mm. And that those are my you know driving factors, you know, every day. Am I going to write my theatre? Am I going to write a song? Am I going to visual art? What am I going to do? Type thing. But yeah, moreover. Um, so yeah, they, when you see our people, then they walk in the streets there. Like we had Aunty Sherry mm -hmm. pass away, you know, last year in, in the prison watch house here. You know, and, and, and an officer got stood down and we wait, we're still awaiting the coronal investigation around exactly what happened and stuff. But, you know, when you look at so many of our people, and it's a conversation that I have, and it's, it's confrontational, it's awkward. You mm -hmm. know, particularly when you, you know, you're talking with white followers or other people that aren't, aren't informed or haven't met a yep. black follower. Yep. That that their you know intergenerational uh, perceptions yes. that have been passed down, which is you know skewed. Yes. You you, you don't know what it's like. Yeah, but there's no racism in, in Queensland government in the QPS. I'm like, dude, you're kidding yourself. You're kidding yourself. <laughs> yeah. And some of these people are friends of mine. Yes. But it's about sitting down and having a conversation. Yep. I remember having a conversation with one of my closest mates. He was like, Brian, he said, I've never heard you speak like that. And I'm so sorry. I said, Well, you know, it coming from a place where it's real. You know, what if my grandsons mm. are to be driving a deadliest car and for, for some reason they're visiting their Auntie Bobby, one of their cousins in Anala? What do they do if they get pulled up? Mm. Oh, you know, what are they doing in Anala in the first place? I'm like, do you see how you sound? Mm. Do you see how you sound? Yep. You know, you know, you know the coppers are going to pull over. They're going to pull over that black kid in that deadly car. Hey. And this still happens 2021. Of course, they profile. They so, profile. So this, this journey has taken you now in a role as the chair of the, the foundation. Yeah. And what's that called again? Uh, the Dajua. Dajua Foundation. So that was established out of um, an unfortunate death of um, the, the executive officer, um, April Day Watson. Uh, she, she had established it from down there in Victoria and stuff. And um, it's just a, a, um, an organisation that is um, run, directed by, by families affected by Black Death in Custody. So there's five of us boards, um, um, yeah, board directors, yep. and they've nominated me as chair um, probably about three months ago, which is, a, which is a position that I take seriously. Yes. I've nev never really stepped into this space. I've always um, advocated through music, um, discussing um, issues that um, you know, still affect us today as they would back in the bygone days. So um, you know, in life, you know, the, the, the vicissitudes, and we're talking about that, outside the grid, you know, you have your ups and downs and, um, but as I said, it's how you respond to that in terms of making that difference because we're only here for a short little dance mm, in mm. the scheme of, yes. of life. Yes. We could be gone within a minute, but what is your legacy at the end of that? Yes. Whether that be through music, whether that be through your political views, you, you know, your, your take on what's happening, particularly from a black man who um, has, felt, has found that balance. We're talking about balance. Yes. Finding that balance That's between right. this concrete here, but also that old world. The ability to sit by a, by a fire. That, 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 that exchange with the old, that old king, mm. that old man, has put so many things into perspective. Now we're, number one, I can safely put down the beer. I can pick up my spear. Mm. I can put down those smokes, because that's contaminated my inner, yep. my inner spirit. I can stop gambling. I was taking all my money. There's yep. no food in my fridge. Mm. You know, so all those, um, those faculties that were, you know, keeping me emasculated, keeping me chained under that water, 
Yes. I said, no more. I can't breathe. Mm. I can't breathe. That's why I've a period of time I was facing and dealing with my own inner demons in terms of, um, you know, my, my health mm. and, you know, all these other factors that just compounded, you know, you know, throughout a period of time. And I, there was a period that I couldn't walk for a year. I didn't tell, you know, I just kind of escaped up to, up to Cairns to be closer to the country for a good eight-year period, yep. which was beautiful. Because I reacclimated. But you needed to heal I yourself. You, you I reacclimated the country yeah. and I sat down by that old fire. And I learnt about me and what makes me tick and who I was in terms of my connection to country. And how does that country affect me down here? I might be far away from where the stars kiss the sand mm. right up there, but when I sing, when I talk, it, it goes back up there. And also paint. You're an artist too, Dan. Artist, yeah. And a Damn good one. I, yeah, and, it's, and you know, it's, it's another therapeutic um, um, outlet for me. Yes. So when I'm, you know, painting and stuff, you know, whether I'm doing a portrait, whether I'm doing a landscape or, um, you know, my traditional contemporary stuff, it's, it's just my take on, um, you know, um, my connection. Mm. My connection to country. To country, and that's so important for our people mm. these days. You know, so many of our people are in contact. Yeah, overly in contact, overtly in contact with the justice and the custodial systems, and it's about you know uh, just instilling that um, that cultural strength and passing our brothers and our sisters their cultural spears to say, hey, no, you want to talk about initiation? It's not initiation to go to go to jail. That's not the initiation. Mm -hmm. the initiation is our family, looking after your kids, looking after your missus, yeah, the young women looking after their babies, you know, looking after our grandparents and vice versa and stuff. And it's about breaking those chains. Breaking those chains where down, you know, more over and stuff. Like I've been blessed with that opportunity. As much as I bumped my head mm. many a time through my own faults, mm, mm. which we all must be accountable to, to the decisions that we make and, you know, the intentions that we have. But, you know, as a, as a 40 plus year old man now reflecting and stuff, I'm like, okay. Well, I've seen the highs, but I've definitely seen the lows. And I can see I've walked to that valley and, and it's been dark. And so are the younger people hearing what you're talking to them about, do you go into the juvenile um, prison? Do you go into the youth detention? So, yeah, between 2006 to 10, I actually worked in the um, youth detention centre. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, that was great, you know, just to get in there one-on-one, -on -one, you know, within um, the constraints of a, you know, of a centre. Yes. Of a prison, yes. essentially, you know. Mm. You know, there'd be some nights where I'd be on a night shift and I'd see a young little ten-year-old coming through. And that little baby, he, he crying for his mum. I just, can I call my mummy? I said, you can't call mummy right now. It's four o'clock in the morning, my boy. Mm. Just sit there, you know. Can I have a glass of milk? Yeah, I'll call up soon. I'm not, we're not allowed to open the doors. Mm. We need two people. Yep. Do you know what I mean? So when you put things into perspective, and that's why through this being a chair and stuff, there's so much that I'm advocating for, Once you know, all those personal experience of seeing that. I've seen, you know, your young sisters slashing up in, you know, inside and stuff. You, you don't, you, you don't lose track of that. No. You don't lose sight of that. So that's why looking back to this bigger picture and this role that I've fortuitously just come across. And it's a national role too, isn't it? This it's is about death in custody. Role. So what are some of the statistics? Like what's going on at the moment? Is it, is it on the increase? Is it on the decrease? Well, at the moment, you know, since the 1991 uh, Royal Commission into Happiness on Death in Custody, Yep. 474 black coffins have been lowered into the ground. And in terms of accountability from, you know, government, QPS, from prison authorities, you know, also, you know, take, taking into account health, you yes. know, all, all these, um, you know, different bodies and stuff, you know, there's no, you know, we, 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 we challenging, we say, no, 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 no. Who's policing the police? Mm. Who's policing these, um, the, these, um, these people in these blue super, superhero uniforms out there? Mm. Don't get me wrong, we need police. Yes. We need police. Mm. We're not that, you know, that ignorant. Mm. We need people to be out there to police, you know, to a certain degree. But what happens when you have issues where, you know, that can be preventable? And does when this you're hanging up, you know, on someone's chest or... You know, I've, I've been just informed, like, from a CLO recently that... I'm not going to say what centre and stuff, but a man, an old elder, had um, um, heart problems. He, he just opened heart surgery the year before and they were on his chest and banging him down and stuff like that and... Just all these little stories and stuff, to which I've seen myself. Mm. But also working with then, you know, um, the corridor between 
um, um, being laid tetrich, the, um, what do you call it? Um, I'm losing my train of thought. Watch houses. Yes. But also the way you treated when you walk into those various, because we're there to make sure our clients mm. are all right and stuff. But we can see that, you know, hey, and the way that we treated, just like, oh man, this stinks. This stinks, but I'm here to do my job. I'm not going to let you put me off doing my job. Let me see him. Let me see her, you know? Because you need to check in to make sure that if they're a potential, you don't want them to be a statistic of a death in custody. Absolutely. So you have every right to check in Absolutely. on Absolutely, but, you know, particularly between, you know, between the period of, you know, post-colonisation to 1991, when they started documenting, hey, there's a lot of blacks. Mm. There's a lot of blacks that are dying. Yeah. And, you know, within these circumstances, mm, mm. we need to start doing something. It was, um, you know, the push of Pat Dodson and a lot of the old, um, the old, you know, the leaders back in the day, um, yep. Les Melisa. Yep. All them old, you know, venerate them, mate. But, you know, if it wasn't for them to, no, 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 we've had enough. Yes. We need to start putting measures in place to divert our people getting in contact with the justice custodial system. You know, it's like, you know, yeah. So, and, it's, and it's a fight and it's a, an argument. And it's a conversation that, you know, needs robust exchange with all many different levels of government. But from a family perspective and from a chairperson perspective, when families do get in contact, and they're going to be more mm. in future, unfortunately, mm. we assist them, whether it be, you know, with legal ad advice, whether it be assistance towards, you know, attending coronal inquest, funeral, sorry, business, food, all the above. Yes. Yeah. There's a quote that they're always there that's, and I'm, and I'm so happy to be a part of that, to give back to community and make sure that there is something that our sons and daughters can latch on to and take it further. Because where are we going to be 50 years down the track? Who knows? But we want to make sure that that coexistence between that old fire and this, this, this fire here is strong. So do you think, you know, in terms of the relationships of colonisation, the government, through these processes of the institutions acknowledging the damage that they caused um, the first Australians, you know, when they um, sort of arrived over that period. I mean, 1992, there was the Redfern speech with Paul Keating mm. in at Redfern. You know, deeply sorrow that they'd bought the disease and they bought the alcohol and, you know, that was sort of step one. And then through Rudd's, hey, Rudd. you know... 98. Yeah, and through these periods of um, uh, the stolen generation, yeah, you know, the United Nations... Um, bring them home report. Yeah, I think in terms of the conversation and awareness is, um, is, is in its infancy stage. Yeah, we have all that beautiful moments, but we look, we look on another, you know, 13 from 2008, Cairo, I was actually singing down there. And when you were saying, sorry, that was my, na my nana's 70th, uh, 70th birthday. Yes. So it was a very special moment for me representing my nana's, my, that fish at Berry Gubba side down there and stuff, but there's still so much work to be done in terms of um, you know, um, just informing, but also being in conversation with the many levels of government, but also the broader community. As I said, those intergenerational perceptions about, oh, look at those blacks under the bridge there, look at those blacks over Moscow Park, look at them. How come they're stopping the bridge, they're stopping the traffic and stuff? Because well, mm. we are the voice of the unheard. Yes. You know, you, you just sit back over there, you know. We'll, we'll, we'll get to you fellas later. Just. Stand down the back there. You can march and protest, but down the back. No, after that, we front mm -hmm. and centre. Yes. We, we, we demand change. Mm -hmm. We demand change. We are conformed, but to a certain degree over that period of time, which was, you know, some human rights violations mm -hmm. had occurred. Yes. Massacres yes. over here. That lynching tree just up the road there. Lynching blacks. And it was like, it was, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a sideshow, mm -hmm. you know? So these are the, some of the things that, you know, people must remember. Before you have a view about, you know, well, why was your Auntie Sherry locked up in the first place for? Those types of remarks. Mm. Well, that, that, no, 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 no. Mm. You're not, you, you're an informed person. Yeah. Well, you come across informed. How can you say something that is so, oh, just inexplicable? Mm. <laughs> it just, mm. it just, it just grates me. But that's part of, you know, I think why I'm, why I'm still here. You know, I had my, 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 my heart surgery last year and I, I was knocking on death's door. Mm. Mm. You know, I was knocking on death door. I had two strokes, I had two heart attacks. 2019, I had open eye surgery last year, where they said I nearly lost my life. I went down six times, but throughout that process, when I started seeing all the mole people converge around my bed and stuff, and I said, well, if I make it through this last surgery, I know that I'm ordained to do something. And then a month later, I was there front and center, 
you know, for, for, for the family represented on the sherry. Mm. You know, we, we, we want answers. Yes. Do you know what I mean? So yes. in terms of the bigger picture and stuff, it's just making sure that those platforms for, for um, you know, for change that our grandfather Don Brady, when he was marching across here in the 60s, that's mm. my old grandfather, my grandfather's brother, he was over in the 60s lobbying at King George Square, sitting there for five days protesting protesting about, no, nah, this is not good enough. Yes. In a time where they're still governed under the Aboriginal Protection Act. Mm. These are things that we don't forget, and these are the things that I make sure that when I'm talking to our younger people, particularly my sons, that they are aware that, hey, there, there's a lot of blood that's been shed. Yeah. But, you know, we, 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 that, you know, we're not seeking revenge. Mm. We're seeking equality. We're seeking you yes. know, transparency and accountability from the system. Which is what all of these... Uh challenges that are placed there, I don't know if challenge is the right word, but, you know, deaths in custody, you know, um, Australia Day slash Survival Day, Invasion Day, you know, that's a really, um, you know... It's a sense of the time for the community. Totally. And then you've got the whole Uluru Statement of the Heart and whether, you know, there should be recognition or a constitutional thing or that's even offensive to many for the right reasons too. Yeah. That whole debate. But teaching your children, why it's important, why all these things are all, as you said, moving towards equality, uh, truth telling, truth listening, yep. healing, and some form of coming together so that there's no further feeling of oppression. Yeah. Is that, is that probably what yeah, and, it, and it's um Yeah. And it's breaking the chains. Yes. You know, I'm talking about, you know, being, us being emasculated, like being chained. Yep. It's breaking away from all those factors that are just keep on binding us to the ground. I can see, like, I've, I've let go and I've been sober four years now. I haven't smoked for eight years. Yep. I have a gamble for a year and a half. Mm. I've got money in my pocket. I'm like, oh, guys, you want to go to the beach today? Mm. Grandsons, come on, we'll go. And how's that feel? Man, I really just, I'm, I'm just, I, I, my, my views are panoramic. Like, I can see all that and I can see it clearly. I woke, I woke up this morning, I was like, I'm going to the gym. I'm gonna to go to Jim Hart, I'm gonna do three Ks, walk. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm primed and I can sit down and have a good yarn with my dear brother, mm. you know? And, um, and that's how it is for me each day. I battle with lupus, the lupus, it, it affects your immune system and stuff. And yes. that's a daily occurrence, but you know, they said that you can live, but it's, it's just a matter of just dealing with the little things. Like breaking away from all those stresses. Get rid of all your stresses and just try and breathe. But what a great Breathe. lesson you've had to Breathe. go through to then share that lesson with all your, all your family and yeah. your mob too. Yeah, absolutely. That you don't need to be drinking, you don't need to be smoking, you no. don't need to be gambling. All those things are, weren't here prior to colonisation. That, that old man said in, that. You know? He said, tell them. Mm. So he, I remember my uncle saying to me, he said, tell them. Tell them all down there, they don't need to do A, B, C, D. Their country is waiting for them. That's right. The old fire is waiting for them. It was there you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And from a man that carried 60,000 years, Yeah. it wasn't diluted by the time it got to me. Mm. I heard it from his mouth. Yes. I exchanged with him. It was only that one time. Yep. But that one time for me, it was just that was the pendulum shift. I was like, okay, I'm armed. I'm ready to rock and roll. Yep, I've had two strokes. Yep, I've had two heart attacks. Yep, I went through a divorce. Yep, I dealt with gambling. Yep, I dealt with so many things. But... I'm still here. It's remembering who you're meant to be. Mm. You know? Well, who is the real you? Yes. And it's mm. not until later on in your life that you, that you can demonstrate that, but really, you know, um, I don't know, it's just like find, find your calling, find your purpose. And it's just like, you know, you were saying to me about all your faculties, your spiritual, mm. your emotional, your physical. I'm like, you know, that's a beautiful thing. Because, mm. you know, I, I know what that's like too. Yes. I feel and I live it each day. When I hold my grandbabies, I'm like, man, I'm mighty. How I dreamt about you when I was in hospital for three and a half months and I could not move. But I can hold you now and I can run after you now too. You know? You're going to be a great, great grandfather. Yeah. You know, <laughs> a very that, proud that, one. But that's, and that's part of that passing on from a black fellow perspective. Yes. Of um, taking your, you know, your, 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 um, your, carrying your cultural spear strong, but also your song lines, that messy stick. Everything that has been passed to me because it's dynamite. If I'm missing that, contaminating that spear with all these other, with all these other, you know, other things, mm -hmm. it'll blow up in your face. And it has blow, blow, blow up in my face. Like it would have blown up for many brothers and sisters out there. 
even yourself. Mm. You know, you're going to play with, you know, you know you're going to play with things that are going to blow yeah. at some stage. Yes. You're going you're gonna to drink that last bottle of bloody whiskey or that, you know, you know bong or you're going to stick that needle up your arm. Mm. It's going to get you and it's going to come back and it's going to bite you. Yeah. That's reality. It's always going to happen. But it's how ending. you go out. Yes. It's how you go out is what's important to me. Yeah, I know that old Troy Brady and I want to get onto my name. My name, yeah, Joel Troy Brady, that was him there, you know, and yeah, a couple of good things, but I go by the name of Jungle G now. Because I'm a different man to was when I got out of the hospital last year. And was that a name from your ancestry? Yeah, Is that, yeah. Uncle, yeah. My Uncle Punji, who was our teacher, and Uncle yes. Punji, gave me that name. He gave my boys their name, Walla Walker, Dita Jenga, Dini Boy. Mm. So they got the traditional names. I've named my, my grandsons, Wawanji the dancer, uh, Wanda G, Eagle. So do you have a totem? Is there a totem? So, yeah, so um, we, um, 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 Muller Ridge is a red kangaroo. Mm -hmm. But see, all the animals up there to us plays its part in our lives. Yes. So, you know, for everything that I see, and we've been taught to read, read the signs, spiritual signs, mm. you know. If I was to be out here and just looking at it like that, and I see a, a you know, a minya kanka, a sea eagle or something, I'm like, oh, you know, well, and how do you interpret it? And does mm. it come in your dreams and stuff? And, yeah, yeah, man. So just little things like you know. You have grown so beautifully, Troy. Yeah. I, I, I'm just so blessed to have this conversation and connect, and hopefully our listeners learn and gain a lot out of this conversation. Yeah, man. And that's and, and it's just about you know our people just standing in their right skin. Yes. Our people knowing who they are. Some of our people don't have that opportunity because of what's happened historically, and I empathise and I. I cry with my people so much and stuff, but you know. But they can change that if they yeah, choose to. Yeah, they, they can change if they choose to in terms of finding out, mm. asking questions, um, being accountable for your actions. You know, if you're going to jump in that stolen car, there's ramifications. You're either going to be chased down by police, locked up, you're going to be a hospital quadriplegic, or you're mm. going to be dead. Mm. And we're your family then. So those little things, and that's the same. Mm. Um, the same traits that I pass on to my kids, you know. Be accountable. Yeah, you like to do things and stuff, and that's fine. You're going to bump your head, mm. like me. But just be aware of your decisions. And know there are consequences. And know that there are yeah. consequences in life for each and yes. every one of us. Yep. And, you know, hoping that you can grow to 20, that you can grow to 30, that you can grow to 40. Well, I'm looking to grow to 50. Mm. Next after that, I'll go the next 10 years and I'll, I'll assess after that. Mm. Making sure that all my faculties are in check too. I can't go back to the old Troy Brady. Mm. He was a bit dangerous. <laughs> yeah. He lived a bit loosely. He scares you. But where Jungle G Brady is, yes. I'm happy where I am. I'm happy, you know. And that, and that's a you know that's a mm. sentiment that I can pass on to all our other brothers and to our sisters to a certain degree. But women's business is women's business too. But I respect our women for what they've been through. Yes. Yeah. Troy, Jungle G, I I just want to thank you. Oh, pleasure. Enormously for sharing all of that wisdom and, and that today. I wow. really do. And I hope our listeners really enjoy that. And uh, I know I have. I look forward to catching up with you again, as Absolutely, always. Absolutely, right, bro. Bro? Always a pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. And thank, thank you, you to all, you all out there. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And uh, don't forget, we're at uh, walkin3worlds.com.au. And don't forget to subscribe at our website. And don't forget to listen to us on all the platforms. You know, Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, we're there. YouTube, all of this is available. And if you really love what we're doing even more, become a patron on Patreon to support our uh, stories and conversations and poetry and music and everything mm. that we're going to bring to the world. So I'm honoured to have our brother here. And thanks, everyone, and see you all next week. Okay, bye Hello for now. Okay. <laughs>